Good to see everybody again, and uh, I hope you had a great little break and got to use your cards <coughs> this morning to introduce yourselves to each other and ask each other questions. Uh, but it is now time to ask some questions of Derek Kazrashahi, who is the CEO of Uber. And it's a privilege to have you here, in part because we got to spend some time together right here two years ago. It seems into, like forever ago. Which I'm sure it does. <laughs> Uh, which was your very first interview after you got this job. Indeed. And so uh, there's so much that has happened since then. Six months ago, of course, uh, you had the big IPO. Today is this lockup expiration uh, on the company, and a lot has changed. So I want to get into all the, the details, and I think there's a big shift that's clearly taken place in Silicon Valley in terms of the marketing, markets, growth versus profits, and I want to get into that. But I'm just curious, if you were to go back two years ago, and think about what you thought was going to happen when you first took this job and we were talking about it here, and what has actually happened, what you think? Well, everything that I predicted in my presentation to the board happened perfectly to, to the T. Um, <laughs> not really. You know, I, I came into the job knowing and expecting that it was going to be an enormous challenge knowing that I would be hit multiple times kind, kind of in the head but, uh, from something unexpected, uh, because this is an important company that reaches into so many different parts of society, markets, uh, and was really a leader in terms of these large private companies that were becoming public. So I expected entertainment. I expected uh, challenges. Uh, I, ex I expected them to come from all corners, and I got exactly what I expected. I'm imagining there's one part of this that you didn't expect, because clearly the markets didn't expect it, which was when, when you first joined the company, this was a company that people were valuing, and <clears throat> bankers valued it, and, and, and investors, even private investors, were talking about a hundred plus uh, billion dollars mm -hmm. for this company. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I kept that pitch book. <laughs> and clearly, the market has shifted in a profound way. Yes. Uh, you announced earnings this week. Uh, arguably, they were uh, better than uh, the market had anticipated. The stock goes down. Uh, Peloton, same thing happened this week. Market goes down, uh, or stock goes down, rather. So the question is, what, you think, where, what do you think has happened to the unicorns of Silicon Valley? And what do you think that shift is really about? So I think what's happening is that there has been a fundamental revaluation of revenue growth and the value of profits and the, un, in, a, in an increasingly uncertain world, right? So the world around us, everything going on in politics, the global landscape has fundamentally changed over the, over the, the past two years. And I think that the appetite for the unknown and high risk in the public markets, it's just gone down. Uh, and that has consequences. You've got some of the safety stocks doing much better, utilities, et cetera. But do you think that's and a, then, <clears throat> you, just to understand, do you look at this and say this is a private versus public situation, meaning that somehow private investors are fundamentally different than public investors? Do you think this is a shift in, um, in just the way investors are thinking? Because it's, it's fundamentally going to change the model, the growth trajectory of your company, because everybody is having to now react to this new reality. Private, investment, private investors fundamentally have a greater risk appetite. They pay uh, a higher bonus for growth, so to speak. And public investors, historically, the premium for growth isn't quite there, and, and they look for growth as well right. as profits, et cetera. That shift, now, private investors, what I found, always do follow public investors with some kind of a delay. And I do think that you're seeing the same kind of reckoning that is hitting the public markets is happening in the private markets. And from my standpoint, I think a couple of things. Thank God we went public when we, when we did. Right? Really? Absolutely. Because we, you, think we you'd be raced, WeWork? you think you'd be WeWork otherwise? We're very, 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 very different from WeWork. OK? <laughs> so I mean. This is, you have, you, 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 have, you, you, have, you have a ride share business that uh, this quarter delivered 22% EBITDA margins, uh, up from even a couple of quarters ago, 8% margins. 
fundamentally the rideshare business is upscale, is global, is an attractive business, and it's only going to get better within a competitive environment, right? But the expectations for and trade-offs between growth and profitability, those formulas have changed. We've got over $12 billion of cash. We've got uh, $12 billion in investments as well in the bank. We've got a great balance sheet. We've got all the cash that we need right. to, to get to profitability. So I actually think, one, thank God we, we, we want public, and two, in this environment, we are advantage against our competition, and at the same time, in this environment, the hurdle for success and the demands of the market are higher. And one of them is great, right. one of them is tough, but I think it's gonna force us to perform. So when you went public, we sat together, actually, outside the New York Stock Exchange that morning, and I asked you when you thought you'd ever get to profitability. And, yeah. and back then, you seemed to be in no rush. Uh, there was at least a couple of years out, nobody was saying when profits were coming. Yeah. Now you've put a marker in the ground about those profits. 2021. How much do you think, though, you've had to dial back the idea of growth as a result of that? The good news uh, for us is that if I look at where we were about a year back, the rideshare business had not rationalized on a global basis the way that it has now. And the profitability that we have seen, the margins coming out on rideshare, have increased, frankly, at a substantially higher rate than we expected internally. And we now have a team that is executing at a level like every single P&L uh, we're going after. The teams are building technology that is automating a bunch of tasks that were done manually, so we'll do it cheaper, better, et cetera. And so the ride share business is actually looking better today than it was six months ago and substantially better. Uh, and that has allowed us essentially to move up the path of profits. That said, you know, before all the WeWork stuff, we made some painful choices internally, right? We, we laid Cut off. Thousand, thousand people. Yeah, over a thousand people. It happened before the WeWork stuff. Um, and it was because we started recognizing that this is a business that's expected to return on capital. Um, this is a business that we are enormous transactions, but at very, very low margins. And if you're running a big scale, global, low margin business, you have to start acting like it. Okay, so, but you remember when, when we would talk uh, in years past, we often talked, or you talked about Uber being like Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I, I always thought that one of the reasons you, you, you liked that comparison beyond the ultimate success of Amazon was that for a very long time, Amazon was allowed and given license by the market, if you will, not to make profits. Um, having said that, they, they, they weren't losing on the order of $7 billion uh, a year, which is, which, which is the number uh, that Uber's lost. And so the question, though, that I, that I have about that is do you think it's fundamentally changed the ambition of the company in terms of what it ultimately becomes? No. Um, the reason why we admired Amazon was, one, they built a great company, and they've gone from books to all of retail, essentially. And we want to go from car hailing to all of transportation. We got into corner shop now as well to go from food to essentially local commerce as well. Their formula of opening up into additional categories and opening their marketplace to third parties is a formula that we want to follow in the transportation space. And by the way, it is a global company that has been able to thrive with low margins right. that they deliver to consumers and, and consumers love them as a result of it. So from a model standpoint, from modeling another great company, it made all the sense in the world. And the fact is that Amazon didn't make money for a while, but was very much focused on their cash flows. And they did flow cash for a long period of time. And I think for us, between now and 2021, our plan is to improve our margins by 30%. We're going to do so, and we're going to be able to lean forward and invest where appropriate. Right. There'll be some investments that we make that don't work and we'll kill them. But I think the momentum that we're gonna have in margins in 2021, 2022 is gonna be a very profitable year, et cetera. So I think we're, we are set on a very strong path, and now we have to execute, and you know the market's betting is against us, right. and that's and just they are. fine with me. So it's fine with you? Yeah. How absolutely. much, though, do you, even in the past couple of weeks ahead of this lockup, and, and when I say lockup, there's an expiration today so that uh, uh, early shareholders can get out or right. sell, their, sell their stock. Have you, how much have you felt like you've had to either go on a charm offensive of sorts 
either internally with employees or venture capitalists or others to, to try to uh, suggest to them that they stay in? Well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it, it's better than my first apology offensive. Um, you know, I can talk about the numbers. Uh, we are reaching out to investors, and I think that the lockup, because there's a lot of uh, supply that potentially could come into the market, I think there'll be less than people think, but there's a lot of supply that could come into the market. Um, there were some larger investors who were waiting because there was no fear of missing out. Now the supply is, the lockup is behind us. I think we're gonna have a uh, couple of weeks that, frankly, I have no idea exactly what's gonna happen during those couple of weeks. But then I do think that we are going to find great fundamental long-term investors who believe in the story uh, and believe in our numbers. And I think we're showing the, how the rideshare business can be profitable. And I think that the Eats team is right behind the rideshare business. The Eats business is much younger than rideshare. Uh, and I think the same kind of methodology that we're driving margins on rideshare is, is going to work on the Eats side as well. Take us inside the room when you've been thinking about how you've had to adjust the idea of growth versus profits. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm specifically thinking about some of the investments you're making in self-driving cars mm -hmm. and some of the other sort of more shoot the moon oriented, you may not think of them as shoot the moon oriented projects, but to, to some of the investors who look at the losses that are related to them and look at them as far out investments, how you've thought about whether to stick in something or to get out of something. And do you expect that we're gonna see you get out of a lot more? We've certainly gone out of a number of countries in which we've operated, right? So we got out of China, we got out of Southeast Asia, we got out of Russia. Recently with EATS, we, uh, we got out of South Korea. So we will get out if something's not working. And for example, with EATS, we were very clear, we're either gonna get number one or number two in every country that we operate in in the next 18 months, or we're gonna get out. Because the TAM of that business, the size of that business is big, is, is big enough for us already on a global basis. As to some of these newer businesses, they absolutely have to perform. Everyone has a performance bar. If they don't perform, uh, then you know we'll right. shut them down and we'll move on to the next great idea. Do you have any investors that are saying, actually, no, Dara, I want you to grow. I want you to focus the, the other way. Do you, I mean, is Masasan calling you and saying, look, actually, I, I want you to be thinking about the future? And I want to ask you, by the way, what you think of, of what's happening at SoftBank right sure. now. But but is there any investor that's actually coming to you right now and, and saying? No, 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 don't, you know, put your foot back on the gas. No. 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 Um, I think that our investors at this point believe that the discipline that we need to get to profitability in 2021, it's the right thing to do for the company. And, but at the same time, they don't want us to make the fundamental trade-offs. You know, you don't want to hit 2021 and not grow anymore. And I think the plan that we have in place is a plan that absolutely hits our profit targets, but leaves the high growth nature of this, of this business intact. And now we have to execute behind it. Um, I mentioned Masa. Uh, Masa runs uh, SoftBank, obviously, uh, has a, a big stake in your company, ha had a, has a big stake now mm -hmm. in WeWork. There's a big question about whether this vision fund the first vision fund's A gonna work. Uh, looks like there's some news reports today that suggest that, the sec that he's actually gonna uh, make the second vision fund and it's gonna happen. Do you think, when, when you look back at, at that, at what SoftBank did to valuations in Silicon Valley, do you think that was healthy? I think he definitely pushed up valuations and I think the question is, will it stand the test of time? Right, I think that to score someone's career based on a, very unusual moment in the market. You and I just asked about how the markets have completely changed, right, in the past month. I don't think it's proper or fair. So I think that- You don't listen, think what's that, proper or fair? To, to judge Masa to say, is Masa good or bad based on today, okay. right? Like Masa's track record is going to be determined over a long period of time. And he has been one of the great investors over a long period of time. I think this is a difficult moment of adjustment for them and I think that they are adjusting and making some pretty strong pivots, and we'll see. Uh, but there's no question that the amount of capital that went in with SoftBank uh, was, did raise the market, and it has created some behavior in some of the other players where they're overspending. Listen, the, the, when the reward for growth is high, the price that you pay for growth can go high. 
And we do have a market that needs to rationalize, for example, especially in the, in the food delivery uh, space. And as it rationalizes, we're the largest player in the world outside of China. It's going to put us in a very, very strong position. What do you make of your critics? There are, there are critics who say, look, um, Travis Kalanick, uh, who was in your role prior to this, may have had his problems, but he was a swashbuckling, uh, ambitious, uh, big vision kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have heard from people like Bradley Tusk, who was an early investor, and others who say, you know what? Uh, I like Dara because he sort of helped maybe right the ship, but maybe this company needs somebody who's got big vision all over again. You know, I think Travis did an incredible job in building this company. I couldn't do what Travis did. Uh, but I do think that I'm the right guy for the company now, right? In just two years since I took over the company, think about where we are now versus some of the messes that we had in terms of governance, et cetera. We did take the company public at the right time. Our bookings are up 70, 75 percent uh, since the time that I took over. And now, when the markets are demanding this path to profitability and growth, I think we're going to deliver it. And we're determined to deliver it. And we have a team who can get it done. What does he think? Travis has been very supportive. He's on the board. Uh, and he's engaged. Uh, you don't have to ask him that question. But in general, you but know, But does he want supportive. your foot more on the gas? Does he want it more on the brake? You know, Travis is there to help. Uh, he's got his opinions about the different businesses, but I think generally we're aligned with the direction of the company. So you, you don't want to get into the debate. I imagine there's got to be uh, <laughs> some, some debate. I do want to ask about some of the challenges, and these are now policy. A, a lot of the conversations we've been having today have been about the intersection of business and policy, and one of those is about how drivers are treated uh, as employees or not employees what benefits they should be getting, what benefits they shouldn't be getting. Obviously, a law uh, was put in place in California mm -hmm. um, that would treat these employees effectively as, em or treat these drivers, you would call them drivers, as employees. Um, and you say, from what I understand, that you believe that this law somehow doesn't apply to you. Which well, I have to admit I do not understand because it seems like the law was created for you. <laughs> Uh, the law is actually based on a Dynamex decision that was, uh, that, that was decided by the court about a year and a half ago, right? So we've been operating under the law in one way or the other, in one way or the other for a year and a half. Um, we do think that uh, based on how we run our marketplace, you know, we are a technology services company, especially now that you see us being in other businesses like Eats and Freight, et cetera, we're not in the business of driving. Our drivers are, and our drivers can, are independent, and they can get on the service anytime they want, and they can get off the service anytime they want. The law is quite technical as to, as to how it deals with these issues. And just because the hurdle got harder doesn't mean we don't think we're going to pass the test. That said, we do understand that there is another model. And for example, in France, we have our drivers who are independent contractors, but they do get health care benefits and other protections which are entirely appropriate. And so we are running this ballot initiative right. in California that gets drivers minimum earnings. It gets them uh, reimbursement for driving, health care, protections, discrimi discrimination, et cetera, protections. And it allows them to have flexibility. 92% of our drivers drive less than 40 hours a week. Okay, the only that is, it's a respectable job, it serves their needs, it serves their lifestyles, and I think that this law is misguided and we're going to fight it. Uh, if, if the law of the land became the law that's in France, mm -hmm. across the board, what would it do to the business? The business would continue to grow. The, the drivers, drivers would have the flexibility that they wanted. But I'm assuming the, mar the margin in France has to be meaningfully lower than the margin elsewhere, no? Not necessarily. I mean, our business in France is actually doing really well. There is a balance. Uh, and, and we do think, now that we've got 4.5 million drivers uh, on a global basis, we do think that these protections are appropriate, and we're willing to engage in these discussions, and we're looking to engage in these discussions. Although I will tell you, any time we talk to our drivers, number one thing that they, uh, that they value, flexibility. Right. And when we tell them, what do you want, health care or more money? They want more money. So doesn't mean that now society wants these protections. We will absolutely 
be a part of that dialogue, and, and we already are providing these, these right. protections in Europe. Okay, I want to open up in just a minute. I know there's so many great people we want to get to. Kara Swisher's here, and I, I, want to, I want to find her in just a minute. Um, but I did want to ask you uh, a, a little bit um, about Uber money. Yes. And also your role in Libra, because I see David Marcus from Facebook uh, and Libra, who's going to be speaking a little bit later. You've, you've stuck in the Libra project. Yes. Uh, a, a number of other companies have, been, have gotten letters from senators and others who've said, you stay in this project, we're going to scrutinize you. Why have you decided to stay? Because we think that the core of what Libra is about, which is to get financial services to everybody in the world, including people who don't live in developed countries that are, have great pen, uh, credit card penetration, et cetera, there is a massive population that is underbanked. If they are banked, they are incredibly ill-served by their banks, all kinds of fees. Um, they pay you know, much more friction than any of us do. There's a better system out there. And I think that the powers that be don't want things to change. But it is absolutely not. Do you think the powers that be don't want things to change, or they don't like Facebook? Both, both. And and listen, our our drivers, these four and a half million drivers, most of our drivers in many of these developing countries, they don't have a bank account. And so we have to, as they sign them up, we have to sign them up for a bank account. And so we think our money project is all about um, getting our drivers uh, onto, kind of digitize them, et cetera, get them financial services that they need at low cost or no cost because the situation right now, and they don't have you know, the voice that we do, the situation is not good. Okay, uh, let's uh, turn the lights on and try to find uh, some, some questions. I, I knew I said I wanted to go to Kara. Where's Kara? Kara's over there. She of the glasses. It's so bright in here, she's got sunglasses, which we could use up here. <laughs> Andrew, you gotta stay on brand. Um, Nice socks, speaking of which, Dara. They're lovely. He's doing better Thank than Thank you. Yeah. I know, they're fantastic. I can't stop staring at them. And yet. That's um, the goal. So, look, I think you're a great guy. I do think you're a shift, a major shift from Travis, but it's extremely low bar. Um, <laughs> and the same thing with the WeWork. gloves come off. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> no. <laughs> Same thing with WeWork. Is that it? Uh, this, no, no, this. no. But, but, but I gotta say, I gotta push back on this economic model that you're talking about. One of the reasons that WeWork was so easy to pull down in that regard is because most people can do math. Um, mo most people can do that. Some of the times when you look at the, the, just the recent quarter, it looks relatively economically unsustainable to continue at this, even the, if cash flows up, even if numbers are up. I'm gonna give you a positive question here, because I think your business is economically unsustainable the way it is right now. What is your AWS? What is your, what is, what is the business that's gonna take you, because you, you don't have the time, you don't have the patience, and you are pulled into this idea of what's happened with WeWork, which I think was the firewall that just fell. What is the business that will bring you away from this, a similar fate? Our rideshare business is our AWS. The so core one. The core one. We had 22% margins this quarter. When we look at our top five uh, markets, the EBITDA margins went from 17% to 62%. All right? In our rideshare business in the past two quarters, 80% of my revenue growth ran through into EBITDA. So when I look at the next two years, my growth is gonna be probably, I'll do eight billion in revenue growth. Hold on, eight billion in revenue growth. And I need three billion to drop to the bottom line. It's about, you know, call it a 38% flow through. And I just demonstrated an 80% flow through in two quarters. So this is without so like, You raising... actually do have to do the math and the math works. So this is without raising prices and without paying drivers more? Because in a lot of ways, a lot of people, you're gonna still continue to get that pushback. No, th this is all based on there's gonna be some price increasing. We're gonna be going to the enterprise segment, for example, that is willing to pay higher prices. At the same time, we're gonna make investments in pool and auto rickshaws, motor, motorcycle, et cetera. This is business as usual for us. We don't, I mean, we need to execute well, but if you can take 80% of your re revenue growth into the bottom line with ride share, then in the next three years, if I need to take 38%, I can do that. 
I can 100% deliver on that. But not with higher prices, because one of the issues no, is... No, there, there'll be some higher prices. So, for example, with an enterprise, uh, we'll the go enterprise higher prices. Product, okay. Sometimes regulation forces us to increase prices, but higher prices will be a small part of that growth, and much more of it is going to be driver, based on volume. And driver, and this is the last part. One of the famous things Travis said to me on stage, in a, in a moment of truth, actually, honesty, of which he was incapable of most of the time, um, <laughs> was that I said, what are you, what's going to make this model work? And he said, you know, Kara, the problem I have is the guy in the front seat. If we get rid of the drivers, that would work great. That would be a great thing, which was shocking. Everyone in the room had a sharp intake of breath. I had an internal cheer that went on. Thank God. That's Woody's truth. Is that a solution for you? Uh, aut autonomous driving, which you guys were into and sort of have pulled back no, on? No, I mean, we're, we're in autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is going to be an important development longer term. So what I'm talking about is the next three years, we're going to be all drivers all the time, right? But when you look closer to seven to ten years, I do think that autonomous will be an important element in our transportation, and it will only become that element when it's safer, uh, and it will be cheaper as well. Now, it won't be cheaper seven years from now, but it will be cheaper kind of 10 to 15 years from now. But first of all, it will be safer, and it will be a part of what we do. There's not, there's not going to be this, like, all drivers to full automation. There's going to be a long period to get there, but it is absolutely important investment that we're making, and we're doing it in partnership with Toyota. That's the best car company So no world. other business ride-sharing is your business? Ride-sharing and delivery, and, and food delivery. There are some other businesses that we're developing, but we don't need some thing to You don't to, need Uber, to, mon to you don't need Uber money. No, Look, I if mean, you the, the ride-sharing business is a great business. But what Grab is doing, for example, this is in Southeast Asia, over time, they, pl they think that ride-sharing is going to be one component of a much larger ecosystem of all sorts of other services that they're going to well, offer. Well, listen, that's... Which, that, which they believe are ultimately going to be actually pro much more profitable businesses. And, and that, that is, that's certainly the potential. I think the ride-sharing and the Eats business together are, are going to be the core of our business. And, and for perspective, a lot of people, by the way, 18 months ago, people thought ride-sharing was no good and Eats was great. Now it's the exact opposite. Right? Our Eats business has been around in its average market for 18 months. This is an incredibly young business. And there's a lot of capital that's fallen into this business, but I have zero doubt that the Eats business will turn just like Rideshare. It's becoming a much better business than anyone expected. People thought you needed AWS to make it work. Not true. It is the AWS. And Eats is going to be a second one. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Kara. We are out of time. I want to thank. Uh, Derek Kasmashahi for being here. Thank you so very, Thank very you. much. Thank you.